Let's move on now to uh, Kathleen Neen, uh, a movement builder, mentor for many of us, a champion for a just and sustainable food system. She's worked on, she worked on the landmark People's Food Policy Project and with her husband Brewster publishes a food policy journal called The Ram's Horn. She's also the chair of Just Food, a local food hub here in Ottawa. Her presentation will focus on the current situation regarding food insecurity in Canada and efforts to reform it to address population health, a stable economy, and ecological sustainability. Please welcome Kathleen Neen. Well, thank you. Um, I have a dear friend who said to me not long ago, you know, I get up every morning and I say, dear creator, may this be a day when I do not have to learn humility again. And I have discovered the lifelong learning. I learned um, a, new, a new thing again this morning. That is, don't make assumptions. Um, I had made an assumption that there would be a PowerPoint here. I didn't check with anybody. I just made that assumption. I'm in, I'm in a university. Of course there's PowerPoint. Well, there isn't. Um, so that's interesting. I change a little bit of what I was going to say. I also made the assumption, so technology isn't necessarily there when you need it, is the assumption, okay? The take home message. The other take home message is that systems don't necessarily work when you expect them to. Brewster and I waited at the bus stop and waited and waited and waited and finally did plan B and got here but uh, now systems aren't always reliable. So I'm supposed to be talking about um, food insecurity and the Canadian food movement. And listening to Terry reminded me that, um, well, I'm a, I'm, the reason I wanted to, to have the PowerPoint was because I'm a very visual person. And I tend to think in pictures and metaphors. And I wanted to show you some pictures. I, I may describe a few of them. But let me start with one which Terry reminded me of um, in terms of the contamination of country food. The, the way I think many people felt when they learned that women's breast milk was being contaminated. And you have to choose between breastfeeding your baby and possibly opening uh, the door to, to serious problems or using a technical alternative of formula with all the problems that that entails. And the reason why I thought about it is that breastfeeding is really, if we want to have a vision, um, I, we've heard a definition of what a sustainable food system is like. But if you want to have a vision of a sustainable food system, um, I would, and food security, I would say breastfeeding is a pretty good picture to have in your head. I mean, just think about it. First of all, the consumer is in control. Some people here have been through this process, I can tell. <laughs> the food is designed specifically for the need of the consumer, and it varies in both quantity and quality as those needs change. This, that's how it works. There's no fossil fuel used in the production of this food. Um, there's no excess packaging. The packaging is um, infinitely reusable and very attractive. There is a direct relationship, not to say an intimate relationship, between the producer and, for the sake of, of shorthand, I'll say the consumer. It may take a while to get that relationship established, and we're going to be talking about that more this morning, I expect. But once it's established, it has positive repercussions for both the producer and the consumer. And finally, and this is where we get into where things start to break down in our system, if the producer is not well nourished, the food isn't there. And the, and the relationship and the system break down. So I'm implying, and you've already heard, that the producers of our food are not well nourished, are not well cared for. In fact, they're going out of business hand over fist. Um, I can give you some statistics if you like. Um, let's see, in the last five years, we've lost something like 10% of Canadian farmers. 
But this goes back a long way further back than the last five years. Uh, some of you may remember Jean Whalen, the late great agriculture minister with his green sombrero. It wasn't a sombrero, cowboy hat. Um, and it was, that's sort of where I came into this picture, started farming in 1971 with Brewster. And at that point, we were aware that it was federal policy to get rid of small scale farmers to emphasize large scale commodity production. And the same thing was true of the fisheries. We discovered that through the People's Food Commission, which was started in 1978 and, and completed its work in 1980, which was modeled on the Pipeline Commission, except that it was all volunteer, which made it a little bit more, kind of a bit more like Olivia de Scooter's um, exercise. We had to scrape together money to make it happen. But what happened to me as a young farmer was that I met fisher people who were in the same boat, excuse me, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, who were in this, I really didn't, who were in the same situation as we were. So they were watching the industrialization of the fisheries and they said, you know, the, the, um, tract, the uh, factory um, trawler, the big freezer trawler, is the structural equivalent of the combine harvester. So if you see, see what's happening, it's happening in both the fisheries. Now that was back in 1980, and the northern cod was still flourishing. Now, of course, I'm a Newfoundlander, so this upsets me terribly. It's disappeared. It was the richest fishery the world had ever seen. I mean, talk about a canary in a coal mine, folks. OK, um, the purpose of this was an ideological fixation on an economy which was based on commodity import and export. And so Canada was to export uh, red meat, fish, and grain, and import everything else. And the assumption behind that is that it doesn't matter where it comes from. It's kind of like the assumption, and God help me, I remember as a young farmer before I knew, because I wasn't trained as a farmer, I came into it from from town, I was a townie. Um, this, I, I actually remember hearing myself saying, well, the plant doesn't care where it gets its molecule of nitrogen, potassium, or, or um, phosphorus from. Uh, I was really, really wrong. The plant cares a great deal. And actually, if you want to pick up the latest issue of the Ramsorn, there's a lovely article in there that um, explain something of, of how, what's the manner in which the plant cares. But it also matters where our food comes from. It's, it's one thing to say we can have a trading system, and I'm not against trade at all. I mean, I'm as committed as anybody else in the room to the big three C's, you know, coffee, cafe, uh, chocolate, and citrus. So I want trade. But if we are not able to provide the basic foods that the population requires, any jurisdiction that can't basically feed its people is at the mercy of whoever does. So if we're really interested, I mean, let's, let's get patriotic here. If we're really interested in having a country called Canada, which has the potential to be actually a democracy, as has been eloquently discussed earlier, where the people who live in the situation have the opportunity to make the decisions governing their lives, then we have got to be able to feed ourselves. We have to have a food system which enables us to feed ourselves. And we don't have it now. As I said, we've not only lost all these um, um, farmers and fisher people, we've also, again, as, has, as has been pointed out, we have massive food insecurity in this country. I mean, it's really crazy. The, in, shortly after the People's Food Commission, it was in 1981 that the first food banks were created. And I remember it well, because it was one of those short-term stopgap things. 10 years max, we'll have this one licked. But right now, you know, we need to have food banks where people can put in food and people can take out food. That was kind of the image. Food banks are now a part of the industrial food system. And I call it industrial because it's based on, on the, the manufacturing process. You know, it's, it's efficiency and speed 
and, and um, single way, one way flow. And that's where you see the food comes from here and it goes over there and it's got to go over there. So if it doesn't go, if it doesn't get sold out of the supermarket or from the distributor, then it goes into the landfill or a surrogate landfill, which is the hungry. That's how the structure works. And if that sounds disgusting, it's because it is disgusting. Um, the other piece of the, of the commodity shift, of course, again, as has been, has been referred to, is that the whole system is now controlled by a shrinking number of very large corporate actors. And one of the drawings I was going to show you, as I do these drawings for the Ramshorn, shows um, two figures holding a skipping rope. And the globe is, is, is doing double, double uh, Dutch skipping. And the skipping rope, one is labeled Monsanto and the other is labeled Cargill. So the world's largest grain trader and the world's largest seed company and also biotechnology company. So left out the agrotoxins for the moment, but they're back in there in the background. And at the retail level, you see the same thing. There's a shrinking number of very large corporations, and now we see Walmart coming in as being a major food retailer. Who knew? Walmart Organics coming to a mega store near you. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the good news. Since the People's Food Commission, um, there has been a growing movement across Canada in every place you can mention to recapture the basics of the food system. And yes, many of those, as Stephen said, are quite small and very local and don't perhaps amount to a whole lot more than growing a tomato plant on your balcony. But I've talked to people who grew up on the seventh floor of a high rise somewhere where you couldn't even hammer a nail into the wall to hang a picture, who decided they wanted to do something about food and they grew a tomato plant on their balcony. And it wasn't about the tomatoes. It was about, back to breastfeeding, it was about the relationship that they developed with food and the way in which they started thinking differently about food. One of the big problems we've got is waste. One of the reasons for food waste, I mean, aside from the obvious that, that we, we have this system which requires cosmetic perfection and has, um, and has all the slippages that is in a, in a very, very large system, is that if you don't respect something, then it's, you won't use it as well as you do if you do respect it. If it's been hard work to get there, then you have more respect for it. And so in the same way as, as a potter, I found that people who had tried to make pottery really appreciated my pottery. Um, people who've tried to grow food really appreciate food and will not waste it. They will care for it and they will actually, surprisingly, pay more for it because they see the value in it. So these little efforts to reclaim tiny pieces of the food system have potential to change the whole system on the basis of a completely different vision because it's developing different kinds of relationships. Now that doesn't mean that we will tomorrow get rid of Walmart Organics. We won't. But it does mean that we have the potential to, to see the building blocks, if you like, of a different kind of system and put them in place. One of the pieces of those building blocks, of course, is policy. Um, it's all very well to, to do this at the grassroots level. We also have to change the way in which government and business does business. That's called policy. And in most of my experience as a community organizer, I found that when I say the word policy, people go, and their eyes kind of glaze over and their heads nod and they, you know, I, mean, I don't mean nod like this, I mean nod like this. But policy is simply the guidelines by which decisions are made. The federal budget, which Diana is going to talk about, is a primary policy document. It, it shows how decisions are being made. And you've got a food policy. Everybody in this room has some guidelines 
about what you will eat and what you won't eat, what you will buy and where you will buy it, and where you will not go to buy your food. And it can be, it can have to do with, with uh, um, a disease. You can say, OK, I, I'm not eating gluten. You can say, um, I want to support the local economy, and therefore I'm going to spend as much money as I possibly can in my food budget locally. Um, or it can simply be, I am not going to eat a Mexican tomato in February because it tastes like cardboard. So you know, I, I, I can tomatoes and eat those instead. So there's lots of different kinds of food policies. But the basic thing, and this was a, an, a really important tool that we've used in, in uh, first of all, the BC Food Systems Network, where I was organizing, and then in Food Secure Canada, was to help people see, yes, you have a food policy, and you are a citizen. Put those two pieces together, and the next thing you do is look, as we did in the People's Food Policy Project, look at where is the gap and where are the contradictions between your food policy and what you want for yourself and your family and the food policy which is being implemented by the federal government. Because there is a food policy. It's just not about feeding the population. It's about feeding corporations and, and the bottom line and import, export, and trade. Um, so the gap, then, is where we have to address our efforts. And fortunately, that's not that hard. Um, there are many, many things we can do. And I just, I just want to, before I finish, I just want to show you a couple of other pictures. One is one that I did at the time where um, we were dealing with Excel Foods. And it shows a little bug in a trench coat with a, um, what do you call that, a Glock? And he's labeled um, Agent um, 05, whatever was, was it, 0589? And the, uh, the caption is, the name is Coli, E. Coli. <laughs> so the point of this is that any large system like Excel Foods or Cargill Foods or any of the other huge um, giant processing plants carries immense risk. And so if we are concerned, as we are very much in Canada, about public health, it's the one thing that comes on the top of every poll is our, our health care system is what we really, really care about, then we are going to have to dismantle that large structure because it is dangerous to our health. The other one is our addiction to oil. Clearly, there are some issues here. Um, the fact is, according to some recent studies out of France, that if, as it looks like we're very much on track to do, um, we increase the global temperature by 4 degrees Celsius, some 30% of our food production will be failed by 2050. So the drawing I have is a little figure, I guess it looks like Stephen Harper, with a, a fire hose that's coming out of a black patch called tar sands. And it's aimed at a globe which is burning. So keep those images in your mind, and I think you'll see where we'll be able to make some changes. <laughs> 